The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He replied and said to him, Teacher, all of these I have observed from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You are lacking in one thing. Go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At that statement his face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. So Jesus again said to them in reply, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said among themselves, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for human beings, it is impossible, but not for God. All things are possible for God. Peter began to say to him, We have given up everything and followed you. Jesus said, Amen, I say to you, there is no one who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more now in this present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. can't see anything up here. <laughs> the apprentice is becoming the master. <laughs> More incense. Okay, good. It's a, it's a, it's a great gospel passage for us. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm laboring on the, the significance of this gospel passage uh, this week because it's, it's so centrally important to us, um, this great uh, calling of Jesus in the midst of this rich man's uh, asking him what he must do to inherit eternal life. And that's where I want to start because I think we don't, we don't really understand what this man is asking for. And we need to in order to make sense of what Jesus' response to him is. So he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The frame of reference here is that in the first century, the first century Jewish mind, they would have understood themselves to be living in, quote-unquote, the present age, awaiting God's intervention to bring about the age to come. And the age to come would be an age of holiness and justice. It would be an age where God's rule was perfectly implemented, not only in, in Israel, but through Israel uh, to the whole world. And God's king would, would rule all the nations. And this would be then kind of the, the sorting out of the world and its issues, right? So part of our challenge is when we, when we approach the scriptures is, you know, how do we put on the, the first century Jewish mind to understand that context so as to make fruitful application of it? Having understood it in its own context, then we can bring it up to ours. So this is, the, this is the first thing. When, when this man says then, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What he's saying is, what must I do to have some place in the coming kingdom of God? 
when God sets things right, what must I do to have life in that age? Or even, what must I do to have to receive the life of that age? So God is going to God is going to act decisively in order to in order to implement His rule. I want to be a part of that. How can I make sure that I am? That's what his That's what his question is. And this is a it's a fairly standard question for for people of that time, especially as they were um, uh, as they were almost almost surrounded by messianic movements. People would say, okay, yes, like this is the kingdom of God movement. We're going to uh, cast, cast off the oppression of the Romans. We're going to move into a new age of liberation for God's chosen people, Israel. We're going to become the prosperous nation that God always intended us to be. We're going to rule the nations of the world and, so, and all that. This, this is what's in the air at that time. Jesus is not at all denying that his movement is that kind of thing. The first, the first point for us to take in is the fact that this man is right to come to Jesus and ask him this very question because he realizes that Jesus is um, purporting to be at the head of a kingdom of God movement that will set the world right side up. And so he comes to say to Jesus, okay, this is, this is it. You're doing the world renewing thing. You're doing the kingdom of God thing. I want to know how to have some part in that. Now, there, there, is, there is some challenge. I don't want, maybe I won't get into it right now. But what Jesus, what Jesus does then is he gives, the, he gives at least some sense of the old Israel thing because his movement is a restoration of Israel. God made promises to Israel that are never canceled out. Right? God makes promises to Israel to be a light to the nations. I mean, he makes promises, I should say, to the family of Abraham or to Abraham that his family would be a blessing to the nations. They, he, they never lose that purpose. But Jesus in himself is the new Israel. Jesus in himself, right? He, in a certain way, he embodies that promise to be the new Israel and to bring about the reality that they were, that they were made for. So here when Jesus goes back to what we hear at least um, some of the Ten Commandments, we see Jesus' movement as a restorationist movement. But, what is he, but, but he gives us some sense here of um, the peculiar interaction with the man and what this man in particular needs to live into God's promised future. When he, when he says, when he starts, right, he says, you know the commandments. Do you know the commandments? Do you know the commandments? We've got some, we got some nods. We've got some sheepish grins. We've got some, <laughs> don't put me on the spot again. Do you know, like, okay, do you know the commandments? Okay, so you know what the first commandment is, right? Thou shalt not kill. No, that's not the first commandment, but that's where Jesus starts, okay? Hold that in mind, because, of course, everybody would have realized this when he starts his little list. You shall not kill, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness. Now he, can I say, makes one up. He says, you shall not defraud. Then he comes back around the top to the, at least to the top of that list, what we know to be the fourth commandment, when he says, honor your father and mother. So he goes five, six, seven, however you number these, and then to the end, he adds another one, defraud, do not defraud, and it comes back up to father and mother. Now, I think this is, it, the defrauding part is very interesting, because, and I always close my eyes on this one, okay? The reason why defrauding, thou shalt not defraud, and Jesus adds it, is because this man is a rich man, and rich men often get their riches by defrauding other people, okay? So now I can open my eyes. I don't want to make eye contact with anybody as I say that, but is, I'm not trying to catch anybody, Okay? But this, but this man, I think it's, it means something that he says, all of these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus doesn't come back over the top and said, wait a second, you've been defrauding people. He doesn't say that. And maybe, right, does he accept the point? I think so. And he's making a, he, there's a bigger point to be made here, is that, okay, this man is a rich man who has not defrauded anybody in order to attain his riches. Okay, so like we can see that. And, and the man then is saying, you know, I'm justified. I'm justified by, by the commandments. But what, he still hasn't said anything about the first number. And actually, I said he started working through that list. 
What did he not get to? He didn't get to anything about coveting. So in this man, in the particular interaction with this man, we might be led to see that there's something that's a bit awry with what? The first set. I'm the Lord your God, no gods before me, do not take my name in vain, make no graven images, keep holy the Sabbath, whatever, and then go the rest. And then, of course, coveting. And can I say, like, ah, I don't, I, ha I have to get it out of my head, it's the hard thing about preaching this way, okay, is this. What is, what is going on in this man's heart? Because Jesus leaves off coveting. And maybe the man, if he'd have said that up front, he would have said, you know, in all honesty, I struggle with that. I really struggle with that. Now, we don't, we don't need to hear that because it's, it's included in what Jesus is saying. But I want to say, like, there are things that we struggle with, and Jesus knows those. He doesn't know, I'm not saying that, like, Jesus knows those, like, you are condemned. Like, Jesus knows those He's entering into the fight. So he knows it, and the man knows it. They all know what's going on. Okay, so I just want to say that up front. But what's happening is it, there's something wrong with his worship, and so there's something wrong with his view of justice and his service and, and the like. Okay, so let me put another little picture frame around it. Any early Christian, every early Christian, will have been able to tell you about what I said, the present age and the age to come, and they will have said, how do I say, in the death and resurrection of Jesus, the age to come has been inaugurated. Even though the present age continues, the present, can I say, sinful age, the present age that is shaped by idolatry and injustice and every kind of um, human abuse of the good gifts that God has given us, the present age rumbles on. The present age it continues. But the future age, the promised age, the age to come, the age of God's rule of holiness and justice, His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that age has begun in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we have access to that age through and with and in Christ. We have access to that, to the age to come. So part of this, then, when a man presents himself to, to Jesus, and, I mean, he, he throws himself down at his feet to say, okay, you know, how do I have life in that age? What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say in the end? He actually takes up both the issue of worship gone awry, idolatry, and covetousness when he says to him, no one is good but God alone. Worship, right? And then when he says to him, sell what you have, give it away, and come follow me. is to say it's all caught up in Christ Jesus. Let me try to translate it into, into our terms today, like, we use, these, we use economic terms. It's kind of banal, but it's like, this is just what we do. Where are you making your investment? Where are you making your life's investment? What gets your time, attention, and energy? Where are you investing? What are you investing in? I don't know how many people think about Coinbase and crypto and, <laughs> and stocks and bonds and what. No, what, what are we pouring ourselves into? And it, you know what? If it is... If it is Coinbase, and if, if it is crypto, and it is stocks and bonds, and whatever it, whatever it is, if it's money markets and, and the rest, my friends, you will not have access to your bank account in the age to come. That's the point. As my friend Father David likes to say, and yet you've heard me say it before, you never see a U-Haul following a hearse. You never see a U-Haul following a hearse. You have to remember that. Now, actually, I like to say this is a, tu this is a tougher one. This is a tougher one. I asked, I asked my parents the other, when we were visiting, right, in England, because I said, like, who, who knows their great-grandparents' names? Yeah, right? This is, no, it's a, it's a tough one, right? Because 
Because uh, what I want to say there, I want to shake you free of an idolatry there as well. We make family an idol. And yet your memory is going to be forgotten in two or three generations. I know, that's a painful one. So that is like, come on, Father, it's like, it was hard enough to get out of bed this morning. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah you know, I understand that. I'm not trying to keep you in bed. I'm trying to liberate you from your idolatries so that you can live a life of, of praise to Almighty God, so that you can have the energy of heaven working in you and through you here and now. That's what's going to give vim and vigor to your life. That's what's going to give meaning and purpose to your life. So shake free of all these idolatries. What are you investing in? I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in your family, but what I'm saying is that you should first and foremost invest your life's energy in the true and living God whom we encounter in Christ Jesus. And from there, being liberated by our act of, acts of worship to the true and living God through and with and in Christ Jesus, we are freed to live totally for Him and His purposes. And then we will find every good gift. Every, then we will find the inrushing of the age to come happening in us and working through us. Then we will have life, the life of the age to come. And that's what we want. Because guess what? Any investment in, in anything other than Christ Jesus, any kind of attention or energy that is not corralled first and given over to Christ Jesus, even if it's for good things, will not last into the age to come. Because the way into the age to come is Jesus himself. So everything that we are able to take with us into the age to come has to be given over to Jesus here and now. Here and now. There are lot, I mean, there are a lot of, there are other challenges in this passage. But what, what, is, what does this mean? Because I want to give some sense. And Wade keeps giving me the feedback that he wants me to use like this, this example today. Is this, like I, like I look out and I see, of course, like these are people who are investing in the age to come. And I think, I mean, for one reason, because yeah, it is pretty miserable outside today. Now, it was, it was more miserable outside at 5.15 a.m. That's when I woke up. And I said to myself, I think, I said, no. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do this again. And I, you know, it's one of those days you can't shake the tiredness out of you, you know, like it's, it's still in there, it's, it's like baked in somehow. They say, no, I don't, I don't want to do this, I don't want to get out of bed. Why would, and as I start like this kind of less than healthy, you know, uh, what do you call it, uh, pattern of thought, right? It's, it's a thought habit, right? It's a thought habit. I, I also said then, Jesus. And as soon now, I'm habituated to this. I'm giving it to you for advice also and counsel, but I'm habituated to this. I say the name of Jesus, I can go. Before that, I'm enslaved to myself. I'm enslaved to my comfort. I'm enslaved to my own pursuit. I want to stay in bed. Just like you, I want to stay in bed. Except that Jesus has summoned me to a better life than I would otherwise choose for myself. He has summoned me to live for him and his purposes, and he is equipping me to do it. I want to get out of bed, but he give me the strength to do it. I know this is like, this is like the greatest victory of my day, and you're all looking like, what are you talking about? We've all got to get out of bed. It's like, this is the greatest victory of my day. Got out of bed at his command. The question is then, and I ask it with some frequency at this point, the question is, are we talking to Jesus? If everything that is going to make it into the age to come has to be given over to Jesus, we have to give over to Jesus, are we doing it? Are we giving ourselves, are we giving everything we have and everything we are over to God for his purposes, through and with and in Christ Jesus? Don't forget this. Jesus is at the very center of this. Uh, he, he's, Jesus is the place, can I say, the place of purgation, the place of cleansing. This is very, like, heavily scriptural. Jesus is the place of cleansing, and he's the place of encounter. He's the place of cleansing. He purifies us from what? Chiefly, idolatry. If we have some other center of our lives, it's only coming to Jesus and turning our hearts and lives over to him that we will be freed from that idolatry.
And acts, the acts of idolatry, the sins that we've committed, are chains that would otherwise, otherwise bind us to those idols. Jesus, by dying, has broken those bonds and liberated us then to live totally for God, to, to worship the true and living God. And Jesus is the place of encounter, right? That is the place of worship. He is, he is the place where we give God uh, everything we have and everything we are. We give God our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And where, and where we're then set free to love our neighbor as ourselves. One of the interesting things about the passage, right, is that the, young man, the rich man says, I've done all those things. I've done all those things. But if he can be liberated from his idolatry and he can give God the, the true and living God, real worship, the worship of his, of his whole heart and his whole life, then even his responsibilities to the people around him will take up a higher pitch because he'll begin living into God's new world by what? By the power of self-giving love. By the power that we see at work in Christ Jesus. How many times in this passage we might think superfluously, but is absolutely central to the Scripture, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And his love for this man, just as his love for us, his love for this man liberates him from his idolatry. I say, we, like, we're, we have hearts divided. We're not centered on God and God alone. We're not thinking all the time, what is the thing that most and best glorifies God here? Do you know what I mean? Like, go about, you're like, yeah, I mean, it's, come on. Dude, look, we're, you got to stick with me on this, okay? Even that was a rhetorical device, just to get your attention again. So, the, the idea is, when we, go about our, when we go about our lives, are we thinking, okay, we have decisions to make. We make decisions all the time. Are we saying, this my response here or my action here, this is what best glorifies God. This, my decision here, this is what best makes his name known, right? And God's name is, of course, generous, outpouring love. I would say, here, is this, is this action the most loving thing I can do here? My friends, those are centrally important questions because we have been liberated by Jesus from our idols to live the way of self-giving love that he brings to life and that he has summoned us to. And so it's, it's ours, my friends, to not only to, to anticipate the life of the age to come, but to live it out now and invest our whole selves in it now so that just as Jesus says, Sell what you have, right? Give everything in the cause of God, and you will have treasure in heaven, Then come follow me. We're making, the, we're making the investment now in what endures. Why would we want to invest in anything else? And the beautiful thing is that this, this, whole, this whole narrative comes to fruition and is enacted here at the altar. And it's great. I'm so pleased to be with the Gerbers, we're all so thankful to be able to celebrate with you today, Annie, as you, as you come forward to the altar in this special way that we, we know here at the altar, we offer ourselves, like Jesus offers himself to God his Father, and we offer ourselves along with him. Right? This is the, this is the sacrifice, this is the, the perfect worship of Jesus that perfects our worship. Jesus, by giving himself to the Father, and we see in the sacrifice of the cross, we are giving ourselves to God through and within in Jesus, and we're receiving into ourselves his body and blood, which is our entrance into the age to come. It is the life of the age to come. Can I say just, I, sorry, I'm rambling. No, I'm not, I'm not rambling. I had a discussion with someone this morning. He was saying, um, he, had a, he had a, was having a chat with his dad about the Eucharistic miracles, and his dad was saying, um, you know, the, the Eucharist is just a symbol. And, and the guy was saying, do you know, no, like, I want to I push back on that and, and whatever, whatever. I said, here's the thing is that if we look at it, just the mechanics of the Mass, it's hard to say, it's hard to give an argument, like, against the symbol. And I don't know what he means by symbol. 
we know that it's not a symbol. We know that this is Jesus whole and entire, body, blood, soul, and divinity. We know that. But I said, if we want the proof that it's not a symbol, then we ought to see how it changes the lives of the people who receive it. That's the issue. We want an apologetic to go out to the world about how this is not a symbol, how Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is giving himself to us whole and entire, that that's not a symbol. We have to be changed by it. That's the only argument that makes sense. I said, tell him, I don't know, what, who, like, Mother Teresa herself didn't believe that there was a symbol. In fact, the strength of her entire apostolate, the strength of her life of service, of mission, came totally from the Blessed Sacrament. Doesn't seem, doesn't seem like a symbol would have that kind of power. But that power also, Jesus intends to have us to have our hearts and lives renewed, set free from the distraction in the end of idolatry, to live totally for God, worship and praise of Him, and to entrust our whole selves to Him so that we can live totally for His purposes.